Diana Wentworth, and I'm so excited to be with you. I'm the co-founder of the Inside Edge Foundation for Education. It's been a forum for thought leaders and all kinds of people who are activists in the world where they meet and greet and expand who they are. And we've been recording 1,500 of our past speakers. And we're going to take the very best of these and offer them on our YouTube channel. We're starting to post them weekly. So what you wanna do is go to our YouTube channel and to subscribe to it, and you'll get all kinds of information about what we're offering. It's so thrilling to be offering this legacy to you now. It feels really good. I'm just so deeply grateful for this morning and for our speaker and for all of these wonderful guests. So I wanna say about Michelle, something that you may have read in her bio, which is that she's had a 40 year journey of storytelling. And she started out in classrooms and schools and children's hospitals. And then she's gone on to boardrooms and conference halls and even into the Soviet Union where is where I discovered her. Mm -hmm. And she actually mm -hmm. told stories over Soviet television to 50 million viewers, and she became known as Russia's American fairy godmother. Uh, she has also had a long career in corporations and so on. She worked for Boeing, and uh, she also went into other countries. She went into Uganda and Iraq and Costa Rica and, and founded something called Storytel, which is an international nonprofit. And then at Boeing, she worked there for 20 years and put on all sorts of special workshops and so on. And also did one-on-one -on -one coaching with everyone from the executives to the people on the factory floor. I just want to tell you what, I will never forget the moment that I first met Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, Paul von Wellnetz and I were in the Soviet Union. It was on a trip that actually led to the idea of creating the Inside Edge. Uh, we noticed that of all these leaders who were on the trip, there was Dennis Weaver and Mike Farrell and the real Patch Adams and Barbara Marks Hubbard and all these, Alan Cohen and all these incredible loners who began to connect and share resources. And Paul and I decided that we didn't have to cook food for these people. We just had to gather them around the table so that they would connect. But the first night in Helsinki, when we were being trained to go in the Soviet Union and we were all terrified and our job was to go get lost in the subways and start dialogues with the Soviet citizens. And um, it was, there was going to be a documentary made about Soviet uh, citizen diplomacy with the Americans going in for the first time. And uh, Michelle was introduced and stood up at a microphone and told a story. And it, it was a deeply meaningful story about what we were going to encounter and how it might feel and all of that. And I was just so awestruck. I remember looking at Michelle as if she were a goddess who suddenly descended onto the earth. I had no idea who I would be in my next reinvention, but I, I know I wanted to be Michelle, that was for sure. And I'm, I'm so thrilled that I get to introduce her to you and that she is going to tell some stories. I have no idea what she's going to tell us today, but I, I just want to say how deeply grateful I am. So I'm turning it over to you, Michelle, right now. <laughs> You're going to make me cry. <laughs> I forgot to put tissue here. I have everything else, the water, this, this, that, but not, not the tissue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Diana. And and thank you all so much for being here and for this incredible opportunity. And Robin, thank you for that meditation because it really connects beautifully with the message that I have. And it, this is how it works, doesn't it? There's a, there's a synchronicity at work here where we have a common intention and something that we wanna to create together. And that's really a lot of what story is about. I remembered attending a Jean Houston workshop, she's a futurist, many of you will know her name, it was in 1981. And I had attended this workshop in Seattle. She was there to help teachers to understand that children have many different ways of learning and we need to adapt what we do to accommodate that. 
So she gave one workshop for educators and then another one for um, members of foundations, fundraising foundations in, in the area. And then I was invited as well as director of development for the School of International Studies at the University of Washington. And I remember Jean saying, now she said, the biggest unexplored space is between your two ears. And in the course of those two days, we went on a journey with her. She had us singing and dancing and talking in nonsensical languages and translating it, if you can imagine. And I came out of there feeling like I was in some kind of altered state. And I knew something important had transpired. I came home on a Friday night and I drank a whole bottle of wine all by myself. Now you have to know, I, I, I'm a one glass of wine person. This was highly unusual, but there I was drinking this bottle of wine. And then the next morning I ended up picking an argument with my, with my then husband and that went on all day. And then on Sunday I started crying and I cried for a week. And I remembered him saying to me, you know, I hope you don't go to another one of those human development workshops because he said, it's really too unsettling. So there I was crying and crying and crying and crying and not even really knowing why. And then about a week later, I was running backwards up the hill by my house because Jean had said that if you run backwards uphill, it creates new neurological connections, new synapses start firing in the brain. And I thought, well, my goodness, I need every kind of synapse firing possible. So I was doing exactly that. And then I went into my backyard and I started meditating. And as I was meditating, a globe appeared. It was so vivid and so real. And there were hands holding that globe in place. And there were words over the top. And the words were peace through story. I didn't exactly know what that meant. But I, I realized that every single cell in my body was reverberating to that image. And I remembered thinking, well, I guess that's what I'm supposed to go do next. I'm supposed to go create peace in the world through story. Now, it wasn't that I was unfamiliar with story. I had certainly experienced it because I was a previous director of Children's Library Services in South Hill, Michigan. My master's degree from the University of Michigan is in library science. I had spent a year before that as a children's librarian. And I do recall the first time that I did a story hour, the children were on the floor. I was sitting on a low chair. I was turning the pages of the book. It was Virginia Calls, A Duchess Bakes a Cake. A group of children, my first story hour, were a group of, of third graders, special ed children from a nearby school. And as I'm turning the pages, I am watching their faces intently. The story was in rhyme and I was speaking the story. And I got to watch the images of that story form in front of the children's eyes. And when I saw that, I thought, this is absolute magic. I will be doing this for the rest of my life. And so I had that background in children's literature. Nothing delighted me more than to begin to tell a story to children and have them zoom to the shelves to get that book so that they could enjoy it themselves. But I also had discovered that there were applications of story in other, in other ways. And so when I was back in Alaska, at that point I was born and raised in Alaska, I, I was working for an, a telecom company and ended up creating a, a puppet show on how a phone call travels by satellite, storying that technology so that children in little remote villages could understand that process. 
And then when I was hired as director of development for the Jackson School, which became the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington, I discovered that the faculty was accustomed to writing lengthy treatises to send to the Rockefeller Foundation and Ford to, to, for money, but those sources were drying up and now they needed to begin to, to, to fundraise from individuals, from companies who were not about to read those treatises they had written. So as director of that $2.8 million campaign, I was there to support them in learning how to tell the stories of the students and graduates who had gone on to do amazing things throughout the world so that we could tell those stories to potential donors and raise that money from primarily new sources. And we were successful at that. And so I was at that place where the campaign was complete. There was still lots more work to do. And then suddenly here is this image, peace through story. And so I, I, I remembered saying to my husband, okay, I, 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 I was never planning to be an entrepreneur and starting my own business. I knew well enough that no school district at the time, this was 40 years ago, was hiring someone as, as the resident sto storyteller for the district. So I said, I, I just need to quit my job and go do this. My husband said, we are a two income family. We have made decisions based on two incomes. I don't support that. I have my architecture practice that I've just launched in the last couple of years working for myself. It doesn't work for our family for you to be doing the same. And I remembered saying to him, but I have a calling and I have to follow it wherever it leads me. And if I do not follow this calling, I will end up resenting you and feeling I'm resenting myself actually for having not done this. So if we need to divorce right now, then let's do it. But I need to do whatever this is, which I don't even know what it is yet. <laughs> well, I didn't divorce at that point in time, but he used to stand at the door every day and say, how much money did you make today? And so what did I do? I did the very thing that I am hoping will be the thing that you take away from today. And that is, I began to tell the story of what it would look like if we created peace through story. What would it look like if I were to go into schools, if I were going to work in school residencies? What would it look like if I were to take this around the world, if people could come together and begin to share their stories and to begin to understand one another? And could we create peace out of that? And I kept telling myself the story and things began to happen. I ended up calling a principal of a nearby school and telling her what I was planning to do. And she said, well, Michelle, we'd love to have you come and tell stories to our students. And that very morning, a newspaper reporter called, it was a little short on news and said, do you have anything? She said, well, we've got a storyteller coming to the school. And so he called me and he said, I'd like to interview you. And I said, you know what? I'm happy to do that, but I want you to do it after the performance. I want you to experience children hearing stories and responding to them, and then we'll talk. And that's what we did. He wrote an article, it generated 70 phone calls, and everything started, everything started. And in the course of those next several years, I learned some very valuable things about story and its impact, which I use with my adult clients even today. When I would begin to work on a story and begin to share it, I would notice where the children seemed to be leaning in and resonating with that story. And at, through the many tellings, it would begin to change, change its shape, its pacing, its timing. And my whole objective was to get the children to take the stories in and to be able to retell them. 
And so when I would be telling a story, for example, one that I told is called uh, Sleeping Ugly, where this dreadful prince is pretty on the outside, not so nice on the, on the inside, uh, is, has, has it offended a, a, an old woman who's a fairy and she casts a, a spell on her. And so she's, the princess is opening her mouth to see if this frog actually will come out. And so she opens her mouth like this, And as I'm doing this movement, I'm looking out at these faces, 125 children, and they're all doing the same thing, not even knowing. And then I would be out putting the books in my car and I would hear children talking to their parents. Mom, mom, the storyteller came today. Her name was Michelle Gabriel, and she told us lots of stories. And one of them, one of them is about a little boy who didn't follow directions very well. His name was Epema, Epema. Epaminondas mama and you know what his mama loved him anyway even though he made mistakes one day his mama said for him to go to the store and get some butter and on his child would go and I would say to myself aha <laughs> Michelle you've done your job because you've told that story in a way that it would stick to that child and now that child has become the storyteller. But the other thing I learned during those early years was this. I would come to a school that I hadn't been to in a couple of years and I would have children come up to me and say, oh, Michelle Gabriel, you know, when you were at my school three years ago and you told the story about, and then they would proceed to retell the story to me. And I would think to myself, whoa, if a story has the ability to stay with a person for that long, then I need to make sure that it's worthy of staying in their consciousness that long. And so I really began to, I had already, but I became more conscious of it as to looking at what are my values? What are the things that matter to me and kindness and, and to being inclusive and to valuing one another, all of these different things and made sure that the stories that I told wrapped around those values. In the same way today, when I work with leaders and I say, are the stories that you're telling a reflection of the values that you hold? And are those stories that you would like to stay in the memory of the person to whom you are telling that story? A really important question. I was doing an after-school school residency and one of the children whose name was Erica made her way up, it was a fourth grade group, made her way up to the front of the room and she had some difficulty because she had cerebral palsy and it took her a few moments to get her balance. And then some of the children were snickering and laughing a little bit, not out of unkindness, but really out of embarrassment for her. And then she made eye contact with every child and then she began to tell her story. And what story did she choose to tell? Beauty and the Beast. And she told that story so beautifully that we could feel the jealousy of the sisters toward beauty. We could feel the anguish of the father when he had to leave her behind in the woods. We could experience the change of heart that beauty had toward beast when she began to understand who he truly was. When Erica finished, there was silence, reverent silence. And then the children began to give feedback, which is our process. And one of the children raised his hand and he said, I, I really like the sound of your voice. And another child raised her hand and said, I, I really like the pictures that you painted in my mind. And a third child raised his hand and said, I really like the way that you moved. Oh. 
moved? For you see, in the telling of that story, they saw not her disability, they saw her ability for the very first time. Needless to say, the next day I went to the school to talk to the principal and her, the teacher about this amazing child and what could we do to support this child so that she could fully express the gifts and talents that were in here. But I also noticed at that point, after all of these incredible experiences of how to craft a story, how to deliver a story, how to be present in the story, in the telling, so that those who were listening could be present too. But there was that international component part. <laughs> Peace through the world, you know, the globe, the hands. So I began to tell that story a little bit more thoroughly and often. And then, not too long after, I woke up from a dream that said I was to go to the Soviet Union. Now, I had heard about a trip. Um, Dane and Perry, who founded the Earth Stewards Network, some of you may know him, of him was planning his first trip. And he had spoken about it at, at a Unity Church function that I had gone to several months prior, but, and I didn't feel any resonance to do anything with that, but suddenly there's this dream and I'm to go do it. And so, so I called him and he said, well, you know, we're pretty close to departure about three weeks away, but I think we can still get you a visa. But he said, Michelle, there is a requirement. I said, what is that? He said, we want to get as many people around the world holding in their consciousness the possibility of peace between our countries. And so we're asking everyone that participates to go out into their communities and to draw people in and to get them involved. And one of the ways we're doing that is inviting people to bring letters and pieces of art that can be distributed on the trip as we go from location to location. And so it just so happened that I was performing at a young authors conference that Saturday. And so I told the superintendent of schools what was going on. He said, Michelle, how about if I put all the principals who were here today in a room and you tell them about this opportunity? I said, that'll work. <laughs> so that's exactly what he did. I told the principals. Three weeks later, I boarded the KLM flight and I had over 2,000 letters and pieces of art from children. And I remembered arriving in Moscow, it took about 24 hours altogether to even get there. We were exhausted and we're going through customs. And of course, everything was checked in those days and to make sure it wasn't contraband or something else. And so they're going through our luggage and these soldiers with guns. But even before that, when I entered, entered that space, there was that flag with the hammer and the sickle. And I felt my, my throat starting to constrict. I was born and raised in Alaska. We had bomb shelters. The sirens would go off and we would go running to the bomb shelters to prepare us should the Soviets attack. And there's that flag. And I am in the Soviet Union. And as we made our way through customs, and they were all these beautiful pieces of art and all these things that were coming out of people's suitcases. And the soldiers were trying very hard to maintain, you know, their stoic look and no smiling at all in those days. And, and I could see little smiles just at the corners of their, of, their, of their mouths. How could they help not help themselves? You see, because it was so moving and touching, this incredible desire to bring about change. And we had many extraordinary experiences on that first trip, but the defining moment for me was when we went to school number 15 in Moscow, an English speaking school of 1500 children, five stories. <laughs> I remember walking down the halls and the kids were yelling and screaming and carrying on a cacophony of sound. And I thought, 
what is going on here? And then I was ushered into a classroom to see a, a, a class being taught. And, and all of a sudden, here are those same children, like little soldiers, faces looking straight ahead, very regimented, which is the way they were taught also. And then I could understand why they had to express their energy that way because of how it had to be in the classroom. We were invited into a great hall and there was an, a, a stage and a lovely long table that was covered with sweets. And we had the opportunity to hear some of the children and watch some of the children perform the Western version of Cinderella. And as we sat there, tears streaming down our faces, they were so beautiful. And all of this fear and all of this angst and all of this stuff that goes on in the world. And we were reminded, these are children. These are our children. So when the children finished, one of the members of our group said, well, you know, we have a storyteller here and, and, and would you like to have her tell a story? And the headmistress, Irina, said, absolutely. So I stood up on the stage and started storytelling. And I chose to tell Russian fairy tales because I knew the children were learning English and it would be easier for them if they were familiar with the storylines to begin with. So I told the snow child, Snogorichka, Snogorichka, come and play with us. I told the story of Baba Yaga and the kind hearted little girl, Baba Yaga is the Russian witch in which she said, oh my, what a nice little girl. Well, you just come over here and weave a bit at this loom and I will go and get you your needle and thread. <laughs> and so on. Afterward, the children gathered round me they said, Michelle Gabriel, would you come back to the Soviet Union? Would you bring more stories inside of your head? And would you bring children to help tell them? And I said, well, yes. What? <laughs> when I got back home, I thought, what have I done? I do not speak Russian. I do not have a nonprofit. I am just getting my business to the point where, yes, I can pay my share of the expenses. And here I am. But I said, yes, I made a commitment. And so what did I do, my friends? Back to the idea. I started to story what it would look like if children from the United States trained storytellers, could make their way to the Soviet Union and to share stories with children there. Stories that, that spoke to the values that we share in common. What would that be like? What would it be like if I could make arrangements with each of the places that we visited? I figured we'd do three, three, three locations. And it was just that, Moscow and Odessa in the Ukraine and also Leningrad, now of course, St. Petersburg. And so I thought if I could pair the children, my young storytellers who piece, I already had a, had, a, had a name for it. And with people, with young people with common interests in Russia, what is the possibility that those friendships might last a long time, a lifetime? And then I began to think, and how could we get more people involved? Well, what if we just sent out a call and invited church groups and individuals and classrooms to create their favorite stories on fabric using all different mediums and then write up the story and wishes their own, their own letters. And we could take those with us and distribute those to English speaking schools and Pioneer, on and on and on. And you know, the more I told that story, the more powerful it became. Why? Because I began to tell it to different people. And I looked at their reactions and I looked at the points of resonance and they had ideas as well. And I began to incorporate those into the story that I was telling. 
And we had a gentleman who said, you know, Michelle, it's gonna cost some money to form a nonprofit. I'll just pay for that and let's just get going on that. And, and then I, I, I went to the schools and or to the press and said, can you help me? We wanna get the word out about we're looking for kids and to come with us. And they said, look, we'll do a story on you after you come back. So I went through my networks. My friends, we ended up with 145 children that applied to be young storytellers for peace. 27 were chosen, ages 10 to 15. They studied citizen diplomacy and storytelling for a year, and off we went to the Soviet Union to create peace through story. I remembered, we had so many experiences, but I remembered we were a, a small group of the children and I went one evening to the Maltese embassy to tell stories. And you have to remember, most Russians had not seen Americans for a good many years and certainly not children. So this was like a hugely big deal to be able to see these beautiful American children. And so we, we went to the Maltese embassy and at that point, because by that time, trust me, it had become world news. We, uh, we ended up that public television came along to do a documentary film called Young Storytellers in Russia. You can see it on the web. We, uh, Tom Brokaw heard about it and sent a film crew to Seattle to do a clip for the NBC Nightly News. Christian Science Monitor contacted. By the time we left, we had even met with President and Nancy Reagan, who gave us their good wishes and blessings on this trip. And he had just been meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev through the time of perestroika. So everything suddenly, it was like everything, the timing converged, it was all working. And so there we are at the Maltese embassy. And the first thing we did was to meet the woman that was going to be our interpreter, a very reserved, proper Russian woman. <laughs> and, and I remember saying to her, well, you know, the children have been trained to where they will tell some of this, because we were used to non-English speaking audiences, they will tell some of the story, then they will stop, and then you will translate, and then they will continue and back and forth and back and forth until the end. And I said, will that work for you? She said, absolutely. Then I said, you know, what would be really wonderful is that we would like you to also, in addition to the words that you're translating, that you would also mirror the movements that the children are making as you retell it in Russian. And, she, and I said, could you do that? And she said, Oh, of course, <laughs> I thought, I'm not so sure about that one, but let's see what happens. So it was Heidi who was the first one up. And Heidi was 10 years old, but she looked like she was eight. She had red hair burnished with orange and gold, a splash of freckles across her nose, a separation between her teeth. She was our version of Pippi Longstocking. And the story that she was telling was the story of the three pigs and a very animated teller she was and so of course you all remember the wolf comes to the first pig's door and he says well then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in she did it just like that and I'm watching the interpreter and she's watching this child <laughs> and then she looks out into the audience and she says in Russian that we could understand what she said. She said, um, well, then the wolf said, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. Just like that. Well, it came time for the wolf to come to the second pig's door. And she was even more animated because the audience loved her and they were responding to her. And you know what happens when someone listens to your story and they're receptive and they're open and they're supportive. Your story gets bigger, your story gets better and indeed hers had. And so she was even more animated. And so the wolf said, well, then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. <sighs> And the woman's looking at her, her eyes are getting really big. And I'm thinking, I'm wondering if she's thinking, did I volunteer for this or was this assigned to me? But all of a sudden she looked out at the audience and she said, well, she said, hmm, the wolf said what he said last time. <laughs> Just like that. Well, remember little Pippi Longstocky? She's like looking at her. <laughs> because she knows it perfectly well. She has not translated 
what you just said. <laughs> and I thought, okay, sweetheart, what you gonna do with that one? And as I'm watching Heidi, all of a sudden her foot starts tapping and she puts her hands on her hips <laughs> and she turns to the woman and she says to her, no, 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 she said, you have to do it again. And she made the lady do it again. Well, something happened to her because she got into it. <laughs> And not only did she mimic sounds and movements of Heidi, but she did it for all the other children and she did it for me as well. She came up to me at the end of the evening with tears in her eyes. She said, Michelle Gabriel, she said, I didn't know I could tell stories like this. I haven't felt like this since I was a small child. Tell me, please, when are you coming back? That evening when I was debriefing with the children, I said to them, you know, we have a banner, Peace Through Story, Young Storytellers for Peace, but I want you to know that what you did tonight, starting with Heidi, is you helped that woman find her own peace. You enabled her to capture and to bring back to herself a part of herself that she had lost. You brought that back to her. She is now more fully formed than she was before she started. And you are the ones who did that. And my darling young storytellers, this is what peace looks like. Both peace within ourselves when we come to peace with our own story and peace in the world when we do that. A little girl wrote to me and said, you have brought me to the land of fairy tales and left me there, facing my own dreams and feelings. And I am so much better for it. Those were extraordinary moments. And I also can tell you, having still receiving emails from my young storytellers, even at this time, but so many years later, 35, that Many of those relationships, well, they ended up actually being in one another's weddings and some of them ended up studying Russian. And some of them said that they had a global view of the world because of that initial experience with young storytellers for peace in 1986. The next year I took teachers and then as Diana mentioned, I, they, I was asked to do a film series for Soviet national television storytelling favorite stories of American children. And I have to remember now, this was all volunteer, no payment involved, <laughs> but it was my way of being of service and the invitation came. And so I responded because life is about saying yes. Life is about saying yes. And then seeing what unfolds for us in the process. And I was in several different locations where the filming was being done, and then they ended up airing in them, these programs to 50 million people. But they did more than that. They actually took those tapes and sent them off to pedagogical institutes to teach teachers of English how to storytell with expression. It's like one of the journalists said in Odessa, these children and Michelle don't just memorize stories. They tell them that from the heart, and that makes all the difference, and indeed it does. So one day I was in a Moscow workshop, and a gentleman came up to him, me, and because I was really recognized at that point everywhere. I think they were a little short on programming because they aired those programs a lot. And, uh, and he said, Michelle Gabriel, I'm a member of the Bolshoi Symphony. And he said, you know that story that you tell on TV, The Runaway Bunny? I said, yes, I, yes. He said, Michelle, he said, 
I tell that to my two-year-old son every night before he goes to bed. And I am so moved because I know that that child will grow up with the memory of his papa storytelling to him before he went to bed at night. I grew up without a father. My parents separated when I was three. My father lived about 50 miles away in Palmer, Alaska, and I saw him only infrequently. And there had always been this hole in my heart around that relationship. But here's what I've come to discover, another valuable thing about story, is that when I would hear stories like this, the love between a father and his child, stories I would tell in which there were strong fathers in the story, other stories that were shared with me, every single one of them began to work its magic in my own heart and to fill up that hole. And for me to experience vicariously, but still powerfully, the love of a father for his child. And I thought, you know, with all of these things, there's so many other places that the story has taken, but in each call, like with young storytellers, I began to story what was possible and things began to happen. I created an event for a little girl dying of cancer and went and did her eulogy at the parents' request. And then they said, Michelle, we'd wished you'd been there for all those years she was at Children's Hospital. And as soon as they said that, I knew exactly what I was to do next. And that was to bring the power and the comfort and the healing of story to children in a hospital setting. Two of those stories are in Chicken Soup to Inspire the Body and Soul that was edited by Diana and also by Dan Millman. And in that, I, I knew if I came to the hospital with just a good idea and no funding, having been a fundraiser, they would say, good idea, no funding. And I didn't want that. So what did I do? I told myself a story of what it would look like if there was a resident storyteller at Children's Hospital in Seattle. And what would she be doing? And what, how would she be interacting with the children? And all and on and on and on. And the story got more and more powerful. I wrote it up. I went out and got the funding and brought the foundation representative and myself to the hospital to present the idea, making it impossible to say no. And indeed they didn't. And ended up seeing 1900 patients and their families at Children's Hospital over a 10 month period. And for me, I thought, well, that is it. That's where we're at now, but that is not where we were at there was something else that was to happen. And that was something I could never have imagined when I thought about what does it look like peace through story, trust me, I never ever expected to be working with adults on their own personal stories. But midway through when I was about 44, I had been raised in a highly toxic family situation, a mother that was deeply depressed and three young kids and trying to make ends meet. And our relationship was very difficult, uh, extremely so. And I, without, you know, junior prom queen and leadership roles and Miss Anchorage and first turn up to Miss Alaska, but behind closed doors, it was incredibly toxic. Things were said that should never have been said to a child. And I carried that with me for a very long time. And I always asked, dear God, don't let my mother die without us resolving and healing these things between us. And I was given that gift three weeks before her death, 30 brain tumors up in the Pioneer Home in Anchorage, Alaska. And my mother and I had an opportunity to heal between us. And that extraordinary exchange between the two of us, which I'm including in the book that I am writing, resulted in me knowing that my next calling had something to do with people telling their own personal stories. So when I got the call to be a keynote at the Boeing Company Good Neighbor Campaign kickoff, $26 million being raised from employees of the Boeing Company, 
200 senior VPs in the room, along with Phil Condit, who was CEO at the time. I ended up telling four stories for that keynote. A story about the Skagit people and working together and lifting the sky with one goal and one thought in mind. In other words, I didn't lecture. I let the stories, which we always should do, tell the messages for us. Because when someone listens to a story, they listen to it in a different way. And they're able to take and extract their own meaning out of it. And that is also why a story sticks to another human being. And so I told that story, a story about the woman who made it possible for me to go to graduate school when I didn't have the grade point average to do it, got me accepted so I could apply for a scholarship, which I won, and then oh, everything else followed. The third story was about one of their own employees who had been with them for 17 years in the fabrication division in Auburn, Washington, who had only learned how to read and write three years before through an adult literacy program at the Hamlin Robinson School in Seattle, and the Boeing Company was giving them a thank you grant. And that individual, Bill Husey, allowed me the privilege of telling his story. I met with him, I had two cassettes filled up completely, asked him questions. I could tell the man was still suffering from what he had experienced as a child. And I knew that I would be standing on that stage mirroring back that story and he would be in the audience and I wanted him to experience a healing in addition to what I knew his story would do in that room to support that campaign. And so I asked him questions specifically so that I could mirror that back to him. And I had the privilege of doing that for Bill because I did not want him to become the token dyslexic at the Boeing Company. And then I told a final story by Robert Munch. Some of you know it, love you forever. And I had a whole group of mostly males rocking babies and singing with me when people said, you cannot get executives to do that. And I thought, just wait. So I get a phone call about three weeks later. Someone said to me, are you that storyteller that makes grown men cry? And having witnessed what I saw from the front of the stage I, and afterward, I said, yes, that would be me. She said, can you teach us how to do that? I said, you want me to teach you how to make grum and cry? She laughed. She said, no, no, how to speak from the heart, how to impact people the way you did. I said, absolutely. And as Diana mentioned, that was over 24 years of setting up leadership programs and working with folks across the enterprise. And here's what I discovered that when you create a safe space for people to share their stories, and when you create a quality of listening that allows a person to open up and share their deepest, most authentic selves, everything changes, everything changes. The quality of respect that people have for one another, the, the learnings, because indigenous cultures believe, and one of my mentors, the late Angelus Arian, fourfold way, an extraordinary woman, the indigenous cultures say that every single one of us carries a medicine bag of wisdom, a medicine bag of wisdom. But what is happening in society today is that we are not giving people the space and the listening that allows that wisdom to come forth. But when we do, we are all enriched. And anyone's voice that is not included in the collective, we as the collective suffer as a result of that. I believe that completely. And so in those, those years and with other clients as well, I have encouraged people to dig deep and to tell their authentic stories. And for me, it's relevant because growing up, I didn't have a voice. To survive in a toxic environment, I learned how to be social and put on masks and say whatever I felt was needing to be said. But what was my voice? What was my truth? It was my drama professor in the role of Emily of Thornton Wilder's Our Town that said to me, Michelle, the person I cast 
is the very person that you say, because I was told if anyone got to know you well, they would have nothing to do with you. He said, you are not a black hole. There is a person of substance. All the mask let them go. I want the authentic person on stage and in life. And that is exactly what I do for my own clients and my own work. So where does that leave us? You would be so proud of me. I have to tell you, I have a, a digital clock that I bought specially for me so that I could stay on track, Miss Diana, just so you know, and Miss Robin. And um, so here, here, here's, what I, here's what I know to be so, oh, with you, I shouldn't have said that. I think I've just lost my, <laughs> in my mind, you know? Okay, now I, now I remember. This is my third chapter. I'm 76 years old. I don't know how much time I have left. And since COVID and all the other things that have happened in the last couple of years, I've had to really, like all of you, think very seriously about how I want to spend this time that I have left. And here's what I know for sure. As I work with clients and as I help them to find their voice, their authentic voice, that deeper voice, even though they may be good communicators, we can go even deeper. There's even a richer story there. And if we access it, and if we bring it forward, and if we shape it, and if we share it, we have the opportunity to impact the world. And my job right now in life is to do exactly that. To help people who have something to say and whether it's on a podcast or a TEDx talk or with a, a team that they lead or even for the benefit of their own families. Let's give that story voice. Let's give that story wings to fly so that that message can land in the hearts of others and be of service to them. There is a wonderful quote from a book called Crow and Weasel by Barry Lopez. And it goes something like this, and I have to say to you, it is my mantra. <laughs> when stories come to you, I love you. Care for them. And give them away when they're needed. Sometimes people need stories more than food to stay alive. That is why we put stories in one another's memory. That is how we take care of one another. And so I ask you, what is yours to story next? Where are you leaning? What story do you need to tell? to take you where you need to go so that your gifts, your talent, your voice is fully expressed so that you can say as I do, and it's another indigenous teaching, this is a good day to fly and this is a good day to die because I am living in alignment with my purpose. Thank you so much. As always, <laughs> you leave me so impacted and grateful. And it's like you're calling us all home. It's, yeah. it's beautiful. Well, Thank and I have to say, Diana, and I must say this right now, Diana is helping to call me home because I've known for 25 years I needed to write a book and I've been starting and stopping and starting and stopping and I knew when it was time for me to write it I got that sense to meet recently and I knew the person that I needed to call to be my guardian angel through this process and that is Diana Wentworth so I just want to say thank you for giving me the gift of doing putting on paper what I only thought I could do orally <laughs> You have no idea what an honor it is and how grateful I am to, to help shape this book. You know, everybody wants to write a book, really. Everybody has a book in them, a worthy book. But your book is so exceptional with the deep stories and the deep teachings that you just innately pour out so beautifully that I really see your book being auctioned among the big publishers. It's, it's mm -hmm. the first time I've ever seen that. 
I'm storying it, Diana. I'm storying it. <laughs> okay, good. You're doing a good job. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and I just want you to know that the, in the chat that people are raving about what they've just heard, what they've just experienced with you. Scott Hunter said, I think this is the first time in a long time that I've watched a speaker and could not take my eyes off of them for the entire length of the talk. So I think a lot of us are feeling, we just so deeply feel what you shared. And we're going to have a few minutes here of Q&A for Michelle. So I'm inviting you to uh, be concise in your questions. We only have a, a little bit of time, but it'll be really wonderful to hear some really wonderful provoking questions for Michelle. I love this presentation. I am so moved and excited and thrilled. And I wish I was like a hundred years younger so I could jump in and do even more with, with what you speak of. My question is, you talked often about how you began each new story of your life mm -hmm. by telling yourself a story. Mm -hmm. In your mind, did you write it? Could you speak more to that? I love Certainly. that. Actually, and thank you so much for bringing that up because actually it's important that you speak it aloud. It's very important that you hear your own voice because when you hear your voice speaking the story aloud, you notice where the energy is, you notice where the heart connection is. There is something so powerful about speaking into, it's like my dear friend, Jane Yolen, who's written over 500 books, says that, you know, you need to be able to see, to notice how the words sit on your tongue. And so I always would do this as a speaking thing because I would notice, and even when I would do a keynote or something, I, I would interview somebody and the first thing I would do when I would get back in the car, or I would get off the phone, I would notice what pieces of that story were still resonating in me even after the interview. And immediately I would start speaking them so that I could hear how that sounded. And what that, that did is to start to show me those elements, those parts of that story or my own story that I needed to work with. That's what, how it works. I hope that helps. That's amazing. Actually, I'm discovering all sorts of things about speaking things aloud that gives them a lot of power. Mm -hmm. Did we have one more question? We have time for that. I wonder what percentage of emphasis should be put on telling a story versus what percentage on receiving a story that is really intensely listening to what mm -hmm. others have to say as opposed to my old ways of, of being in a rush to interrupt or to finish somebody's sentence or something. How do we allow, where's the importance of the juxtaposition between speaking the story and allowing and making the space for hearing it? I am so glad you brought that up. And uh, because when you have no listener, you have no story. When you have no listener, you have no story. J. O. Callahan said that it is the listener that gentles the story out of us, like so many hundreds of pairs of hands. And what I've discovered, and in my own workshops that I teach, and in and all the environments that I've created where people are sharing their stories one with another, we must sit and be fully present for the teller because the more present we are, the more the teller feels the freedom to be able to share their authentic self. Otherwise they are going to shut down because they can tell that it's not being received. I think it is as important, John, to be a good listener as it is to be a good storyteller. And a quick response, when I was taking a speech class way back when at Alaska Methodist University with Sarah Delard, she said to us on the first day of class, half of your grade will be given to you based on what you do in front of the room. The other half of your grade will be determined by how well you do as a member of the audience, how well you listen and the quality of feedback that you give the teller so that they can indeed be their very best. And that is a lesson that I've taken with me always. And I say, we absolutely interrupt each other. And what happens is that story gets thwarted. That where there's usually in a conversation, never an opportunity to come back to it. It's like it's gone and the train is left. 
And what happens is we end up with people that have never gotten to share their full selves. So when we create storytelling circles and opportunities, we need to make sure that we give our complete attention to the teller and that we do not interrupt. And we do not, other, anything other than we're working on a story, it's always like, tell me more, describe this, whatever, because that helps to bring the story forward. But in the listening, it's to be present in the listening and always ask ourselves, am I here? Am I listening? And am I seeing this other person as carrying important medicine, important wisdom, but I will not receive it if I am not present to hear it? I can see by listening to you that one approaches a story differently than a speech or an essay or a, you know a business communication so how is it what are what is that you know if i have a feel for story, what my story might be how do i approach it how do i structure it how do i start so, so thank you for the question. And I do understand what you're saying. And yes, they are different. <laughs> They're very different communication. So, so what I say when, I, when I'm working particularly with leaders and folks that are doing a lot of things, I say, let's get really clear about the points that you're trying to make. What are the one key point, two key point, three key point? What is the point? What do you want to have stick to? Um, so you want to get clear about that, OK? And then what you want to do is you want to wrap the most compelling story that you have, or you go out and find around that point so that when you are telling the story, the point is being expressed, but through the story itself. Oh. Okay, because sometimes we say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to tell you about blah, blah, blah. Well, if you're going to tell, I'm going to tell you a story about the time I experienced a challenge and how I overcame it. Well, that is so dull and so insulting because what happens is you're telling me what I'm supposed to discover out of the story. Story is about discovery. So yes, you can make a point at the end, that's perfectly fine, but you let the story, you trust the story to carry that for you. And so even in a speech, you can ask yourself, where are the places in my talk that I would be better served to tell story rather than to lecture, for example. I mean, it's like with the Boeing company, everybody had heard all the messages, the importance of giving. That is an outdated message. Nobody's listening anymore. So what I had to find were, four, you know, I had four unique messages I was trying to get to, and I let the story convey each one. Because what you want is for the listener to create the meaning themselves, okay? Much more powerful. If I'm creating my own meaning out of the story you told, that there's a much greater likelihood that it will stick to me. Does that help with your question? That's great. Thank you. And on that note, I know we are really out of time as far as questions go, but I think everybody wants to know, Michelle, how they can learn more about you. Um, would you share your website? Will you tell us how you work with people? and you know what you'd love to do as far as bringing stories out in people. Thank you. The website is michellegabriel.com. My spelling is unusual, M-I-C-H-A-L-E-G-A-B-R-I-E-L, but that you saw that on the Eventbrite invitation. And there is an opportunity there for a discovery call and uh, for us to have a conversation, or you can write me and tell me what it is that you're working on and what it is that you need in the way of, oh, there it is right in front of us. Okay, thank you, Robin. Thank you. And so that is the best way to reach me. There's also, of course, the email, michelle at michellegabriel.com, but that's right there on the, on the website. So that's the easiest way to reach me. I do work with clients on um, whatever the goal is you have in mind. And then we design the sessions I do based on that goal and that delivery, uh, whatever it is that you have in mind. So it's a very customized approach because for me, uh, that's what the way I want it because I love working with the story and helping people to discover more, more of their story than they thought they had and ways in which to share it that will truly resonate and connect with people. That's fantastic. Okay, okay. so <laughs> one, one single sentence from The Little Prince, one of my favorite books of all time because it talks about how you can't buy friendship ready-made. You have to spend time developing friendship. But what at the end he says, what is essential is invisible to the eye. 
It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. So I just thank you for your hearts and for your ability to see into a person's heart and acknowledge the human being who resides there and give thank them the Thank you so much. Uh, everybody can unmute themselves. We're going to, um, I just wanna thank uh, the team who helped us put this together. And I just want you to all to go out and share love from your heart with each other. And we can look at each other, we can say goodbye and uh, just know how grateful we are that everybody was here this morning. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, again, for being with us. Thank you, especially Michelle. for. Oh, you're welcome. It's been my pleasure. You have been amazing. You know, I, even in the Zoom, I can feel your energy. And, and I, I, I honestly, that's, you know, when you feel that coming from people, it, it just, you know, it, it is such a blessing. So I just want to say thank you to every one of you for your presence, for your listening, for your engagement because of who you are and how you presented yourself in this exchange, you allowed me to dig deep too. So thank you. <laughs>